Thank you, uh, thank you for coming. It's a little, mercifully, a little cooler in here than it is out there. How many of you were here last Monday? This is not a quiz, but I just want to get a sense of context. Excellent. Thank you very much for being gluttons for punishment and coming back. Um, my name's Jeff Ball, and I am here at Stanford at the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance. Um, and I have, we have here um, Ian Zhu and Sunny Wu, about whom you will hear much more and much more from in a minute or two. Um, I want to, as I did last week, just start with a couple of thank yous. Um, I want to thank my colleagues at the Precord Institute, uh, the Woods Institute, and the Steyer Taylor Center here at Stanford for, put, for helping uh, coordinate this series, which is called, as you can see there, Rising Power. Um, in particular, I want to thank uh, Lee Johnson, Sunny Wang, and uh, Sally Benson of the Precord Institute, and I want to thank Dan Riker of the Steyer Taylor Center, uh, without whose uh, support and interest in this uh, we would not all be here today. Um, second, I want to thank Sonny and Ian for making uh, what you will understand is uh, quite a long trip to be here with us today. Uh, more about that in a minute. Um, and um, third, we have a nice crowd here today filling almost a room, but we are only one room and it's a big world out there. We've gotten some indication over the past week that the world out there is actually quite interested in the discussion we're having here in this room. So I would encourage you, if you're interested and if you are tweeters, to tweet during our session. Um, I will forgive the presence of uh, cell phones to the extent that it matters whether I forgive the presence of cell phones or not. Um, so pull out your cell phones and please tweet liberally if, it, if the spirit moves you. And you can tweet at hashtag Stanford Rising Power. So hopefully we'll see lots of comments on that. Um, so let's jump in here. And I just want to, by way of starting this, uh, with apologies to those of you who were here last week, just repeat a couple of very quick framing comments to kind of help us get on the same page about why we're here. Um, as I said last week, this series of discussions, which we're calling Rising Power, is different both structurally and thematically from uh, most energy seminars here at Stanford. Structurally, as you can see, we're not uh, standing up giving lectures. There will be no PowerPoints. This is the only slide. Actually, maybe one other slide that you'll see all afternoon. Uh, we're just having a conversation here, which I, which I hope you'll find interesting. Um, and thematically, um, whereas um, energy seminars tend to be largely about um, science and technological development, this will be broadly about technological development, but much more specifically about money about following the money, about understanding how the development, how, how the global business of clean energy is developing with a particular focus on investing real money um, from China in both China and the US. Um, second, also as I said last week, and this will be my last repetition, um, the basic premise of this series of, of discussions is pretty simple. And it is that what China does on energy over the next few decades is going to matter far more to the global energy markets and the global environment than what any other country, including the US, does. Uh, China, as you know, has surpassed the US as the world's largest energy consumer and the world's largest carbon emitter. So in a very real sense, uh, what China does is sort of what the world does. Um, let me, against that backdrop, just describe what I think the goal of today's discussion is. And that's pretty simple, too. It's to challenge superficial stereotypes and dogma about the globalizing clean energy system, a system in which I think superficial stereotypes and dogma tend to prevail. In particular, it's to challenge whatever assumptions you walked in here with about the relative roles of the United States and China in the clean energy industry. The reality, as I think you'll see over the next hour, is that investors on both sides of the Pacific right now are turning those assumptions on their heads. What they're doing which is to say how they're succeeding and, to be frank, how they're failing, has profound implications going forward for the global energy market and the global environment. And uh, I think we have two people here who are going to be straight talkers about all of that. Um, so let me uh, just briefly introduce Sonny and Ian. Um, I met both Sonny and Ian for the first time last spring in Beijing. Um, Ian participated in a half-day workshop that the Steyer Taylor Center held at Stanford's new outpost uh, at uh, Peking University, um, Ian's alma mater in Beijing. Um, and um, Dan, who's sitting here, Dan and I met Sonny at the uh, Beijing Hong Kong Jockey Club at about 11 o'clock at night one evening while Sonny was shuttling between meeting with us and meeting with a prospective new CEO for one of the companies he's investing in. So, um, so, so truly someone who manages, I guess, time zones with aplomb. Um, so um, as you know from, from coming here, uh, both Sonny and Ian are partners at major Beijing-based venture capital firms. 
Um, just to frame this a little bit, both of those firms get some of their money from the Chinese government, but much more of their money from private investors. And, and uh, to be clear, uh, both institutional investors and wealthy individuals, more of them from outside China than from inside China. Um, and they are investing in companies around the world, as you will hear a lot about, um, increasingly companies in the United States, and many of them within a few mile radius of this room. Um, so I think that their point to you today will probably be that if you think you're coming to hear two Chinese investors talk, you're actually coming to hear two global investors talk. So um, Sonny grew up in China. He went to university in North America. He got a graduate degree from some university on the East Bay. It's apparently a quite a good research university, but the name escapes me. Uh, then went back to China and has had an illustrious venture capital uh, career. His wife and daughter live in Menlo Park, uh, just a few miles away, so um, obviously he spends a lot of time here. Ian, um, Ian grew up in China as well, graduated from Peking University, is a graduate of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. We had lunch at the GSB today, and uh, this was a brand new campus. Ian graduated long enough ago not to have known the beauty of the current GSB campus, but I think was impressed. Uh, and then went back to China, and as he'll tell you, has again built a venture capital career there. Um, so both of these guys are in, uh, in the United States this week, not just for our discussion, but to do business. And so I guess the first thing I want to ask you guys is um, tell us about what you've done the past week. Just give us a play-by-play. -play. Sonny, why don't you start? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's always uh, humble to be uh, uh, in a room with uh, a lot of you who are uh, from various industries and, and um, have deep thinking about the subject. I always intrigued with uh, Jeff's inquisitive, ever inquisitive <coughs> serial questions, um, which brings out some of the half truth. Uh, myself, I come to the U.S. often. I come to the U.S. probably 15 to 20 times a, a year. Um, last week I was in Boston Friday. Um, uh, big event happening there, so my business meeting got postponed. But it was fruitful that at least by Friday night things were settled. I, had, I was at MIT Saturday morning, and we were uh, trying to bring the uh, city car that was uh, originated from the media lab there to be uh, deployed in uh, China, hopefully by the end of this year. And I came back here the weekend uh, after the meetings. And tomorrow? Be before that, by the way, uh, the first part of the, the last week, before Boston, I was in Houston. So uh, I told Jeff, I believe Houston is probably more active and more, more vibrant than Silicon Valley today uh, because of the sale gas. Uh, Revolution, and I'm sure that will be a big uh, uh, <clears throat> piece of the discussion today regarding this topic. And you're jumping on a red eye tonight to go where? Um, I was planning to go to Philadelphia uh, because there's a life fair uh, happening there. I promised uh, Rich that uh, we would uh, launch a sub $10 LED light bulb by, by this year and we'll be announcing a 699 LED light bulb at Amazon by the end of April. 699 on Amazon for an LED light bulb. Okay, you heard it here first. Excellent, <laughs> Ian, just give us a reprise of your last week. Sure, uh, first of all, very glad to be back to Stanford. And uh, this morning I was with a Thai and feel tremendously uh, overdressed on campus and really appreciating the style uh, here and the Thai is off. Um, last week, um, I was working on a deal that we're trying to close, and it's a, a motor company that's supplied to global electric vehicle uh, manufacturers, and uh, took on a plane and got to Los Angeles for a board meeting uh, of a battery company we invested who have an innovative anode uh, technology using silicon replacing graphite, and hopefully that would extend your cell phones the hours uh, by 30% or more and make sure you, you, your phones will actually last throughout the day. Uh, but they're leveraging Chinese supply chain and selling to the global market. And then got here uh, to Stanford uh, for a full day program here. And then we'll be on the plane tomorrow to North Carolina looking at a company 
a U.S. company who are uh, building uh, energy efficiency solutions uh, in China and considering investment there. And are those, those are pretty typical weeks for you guys? Uh, this is very uh, U.S. centric this week. Um, but, uh, you know, typical, I would say on the time work, kind of work is pretty typical. Uh -huh. So, so let me just ask, you know, we're sitting here in Silicon Valley, and um, as I suspect a lot of people in this room are living, there's a general view here that the clean energy industry is on its back. There was euphoria five years ago. People piled in, invested a lot of money. A lot of people lost a lot of money. And you don't have to go very far from this campus to find people who are pretty jaundiced on the whole, on the whole area. You guys seem to be pretty relaxed. You're smiling. You're talking to companies about investing in them. Yep. So what do you know that people around here appear not to know? Or how do you feel differently? And I guess to be, to be, to be more specific, when you sit in Beijing and you're on a play com plane coming to San Francisco, how do you view the world? How do you view broadly investment opportunities? We'll get in a couple of minutes into specific technologies. But if you're looking at a map of the world, what does it look like to you in terms of how you deploy capital? And whoever wants to jump in first can feel free. OK, I can go. Um, how many people have been to Beijing here? OK. And if you've been to Beijing recently, you probably would feel there's a tremendous difference, particularly in the, analogy, uh, in the reference of taking a plane. I was on, a, on an airplane about uh, three months ago in, in the winter. The plane took off, and on a high altitude, then you still can't see the sun just because of the smog in, in the air. But when you land in San Francisco, it's so clear, and that's a huge contrast uh, between the two worlds, one world, but two cities that we're living in. Um, the environmental problem is tremendous in China. It's felt on a daily basis. And here, my friends are laughing at LA for bad air quality uh, because the PM 2.5 index is 60 versus San Francisco Just, being just to define terms, PM 2.5 is particulate matter that ends up getting lodged in your lungs and causing bad exactly. things to happen. Yeah. Exactly. But when you go to Beijing, it's on average, I don't know, 150, 200. And on the bad days, it can be 800. Uh, it's a very different world. And that's how Qing Capital got started, really, about 10 years ago, when the world with China is world manufacturer, but the other side of the coin could be a world polluter. And that's now proven true. And uh, obviously, a lot of solutions is needed going into the space. And, and so the huge contrast on the one side is the problem, but the other side is that there is a market demand for a lot of the solutions that's provided by energy and environment innovations. And what we're investing uh, there in China is for a lot of the clean tech sectors, uh, that's where the market is, being it's uh, related to clean energy uh, or related to environment. Uh, and we're investing in companies that has a solution. We're just taking the go-to-market risk. Uh, we're not worried about whether there's a market or not. We're not worried about displacing a huge incumbent. You're not here. worried about where a market is because you're investing in a place where the market is clear and, and undisputed. It's so big that it's massive. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think some of the risk profile that we're taking on is different from the investment here. Sunny, when you look at the world, um, I mean, you're sitting in Beijing, but you are here a lot. How do you, how do you look at where countries fit in? Well, first of all, uh, there's a Chinese saying, wu zi wu wei, meaning, you know, if you don't have deep understanding you're fearless, so perhaps, <laughs> <coughs> perhaps we haven't gone through some of the learning that San Euro has gone through. But I think, uh, you know, we're all here thinking about energy and, and world problems. From a venture capitalist, I think our goal is, is to make money. So the driver is to make big money. So, uh, you know, I'm sure all of us have affiliations to the challenge, the glo you know, higher challenge of uh, solving global uh, climate problems. But I think there are very fundamental big problems we can solve through investing in technology. And, uh, and the problem is global. The solution is also global. Let me, let me ask this question a little more specifically. So Sonny, you guys have, if I'm, if I'm right, about between 1.2 billion and 1.5 billion US dollars deployed in various funds. Right. Not all in energy, but a good chunk of that right. in energy. Uh, Ian, you guys have about 600 million US dollars deployed in a number of funds, all of that in what would be regarded as clean tech, a good chunk of which is energy. Am I basically right on the numbers? Okay, so l let me just ask this more specifically. 
how do you see the role of the US and how do you see the role of China going forward? There is, I think, you know, people will pull out their iPhone, and they, I don't know how many times this has happened to me, and everyone says, here's the future. It's designed in California and made in uh, China at low cost. So is that the future? Is basically is your, is your, what you guys are investing in is American ideas or European ideas scaled up in China at low cost? That's probably a simplistic view, but an the incomplete view. Uh, I think the domain expertise in many sectors are in the U.S. And I think uh, we have to be thankful to the U.S. system for innovation and, and all the great people you know, in, here in Berkeley and <laughs> um, MIT. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, they, are, they are great scientists, great engineers. Uh, but that's just a piece of the equation. Right? What Ian talked about is the market forces in China are equally as important in making the solution work. And we are solving these problems through capital, through, uh, through technology. But at the end of the day, it's the great ideas. Right? The great ideas will pull all of us together. The great ideas will uh, get the money together. What China has today uh, at least uh, we're fortunate is that we have capital formation that's perhaps a little bit easier than the U.S. for, for uh, deploying new technology. The uh, U.S. had that advantage, you know, in, in my old days uh, when I graduated, I joined Bell Northern Research. Those days, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Bell Lab direct a lot of the fundamental research and dollars. Today, you don't have that type of mechanism. Uh, now you're relying on this mercy of the venture capitalists and Sand Hill Road. They may or may not make the right decisions. Uh, they make easier decisions on funding a mobile game than funding a you know, nuclear fusion. If I Why is that? Uh, risk profile difference. Uh, Energy is much riskier. The dollars are much bigger. Uh, at least longer horizon. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, there are problems to be solved on a global level. So I, I keep telling Jeff, I think in our business, it's no longer US or China, it's global. So um, if you can solve those problems, uh, you'll make a lot of money. Ian, and you want to jump in here at all? Sure, sure. I, think, I think one of the important thesis to uh, stress really is the market force that I just spoke about earlier. That I want to give you some context about that. And for example, um, we talk about smart grid, and uh, one of the companies we invested faced a market that was, uh, was non-existent uh, in, before 2010. What's the name of the company? Uh, it's called Miratech. Miratech. Miratech, and they do smart meters. But all of a sudden, there was a program announced that there will be 400 million of smart meters being deployed in the next five years. A program announced in China. In China, and all of a sudden, there is a market for them. And uh, this was a Silicon Valley company, and trying to bring their technology to China and immediately become the top three suppliers and the revenue grow uh, to 10 million from zero in a year. And those are the type of opportunities that you're seeing in China. And electric vehicle, people have been talking about electric vehicle quite a lot. And you have here, there's one success story, Tesla, but the volume is still small. And if you look at China, there's huge, huge subsidy program that's being developed there and now trying to promote this industry. And all the world players of electric vehicle are going to China. And that's where everyone believes uh, the market will be. In fact, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was meeting with one of the chief uh, engineers of a leading electric vehicle coming here who are developing the next generation of pure EV in China. To specific target next generation of what? Ne uh, electric vehicle, passenger car um, for EV, um, for, for the Chinese market. And that's really, I think, one key distinction from what we've so used to before is U.S. design, European design, China manufacturing low cost. Especially for clean tech, energy, environment, it's really the market that's there. And for startups, if you want to capture that market, you're going to a new territory, and that's not a barrier that you're familiar with. And U.S. market probably would take a long time to develop, and you're facing a lot of hurdle, and you can use one hand to kind of the capital source, venture capital, you can raise money from here. I think it's a good idea from the get-go to come to this part of the world, to, to go to China, seek capital from there, and perhaps someone who sit on the same 
board and at the shareholder level help you to navigate a very different business landscape there. And, and, and you know who's someone who's in that business, don't you? <laughs> Hopefully yeah. there, there are two, and then there are some other people who sit, uh, who's, who's actually investing in the field. And that could be, that's a tremendous mind uh, shift. Because for internet companies, you don't need to go out of the uh, United States for a long period of time. It's only that later stage, then you develop your market outside of the US. But I believe for many of the markets related to clean tech, the company should go early. So we're gonna, we're gonna jump now, we've kind of sort of set the broad stage. Now we're gonna kind of go rapid fire through some real investments. And we're gonna try to get a sense of what it's like to deploy these principles on the ground. And so Ian, you, you raised uh, electric vehicles. So we're gonna jump in and have Sonny talk about a company called Boston Power. Has anyone heard of Boston Power? Boston Power's been in the news a little bit. So let me give, let me give the, the thumbnail sketch, at least as I understand it. So Boston Power is a company that was founded in 2005 in Westboro, Massachusetts to make lithium ion batteries. Filed more than 100 patents. In 2009, some of you will remember the federal stimulus plan. Boston Power tried and failed to get federal stimulus money. Wanted to get about $100 million and didn't get it. Um, other battery makers did get it. And so as a result, uh, at least in its public statements, Boston Power said that it was beginning to look at a China strategy as it defined it, because it wasn't getting the, the leg up that its competitors were getting from the US government. So in the fall of 2000 and, sent in, and fall of 2011, Chinese investors led by GSR invested up more than $100 million in Boston Power, um, announced that they were gonna build an R&D center in Beijing and a uh, factory near Shanghai. Um, in August of last year, the company signed a contract with a Beijing uh, vehicle maker to supply batteries to Beijing Electric Vehicle Company. Uh, in November of last, uh, in the fall of last year, uh, Sunny became chairman of Boston Power. Sunny Wu became chairman of Boston Power. Um, last no uh, the, the prior founder of Boston Power resigned as the as the leader of the company. And in November, um, the municipal government in Jilin City, which is not far from Shanghai, signed an agreement with GSR to build a new electric vehicle industrial park, uh, of which. GSR will be a, and at Boston Power will be a signature tenant. So I will stop there. Why don't you pick this up and just explain to us what, why it works in China and it didn't work in the US and what the proposition is for Boston Power going forward. Um, I think Boston Power is a good learning for, for investors as well as technologists. So it's a great company, great technology, and you know, uh, it was uh, well funded by the top venture firms here, right. Renrock, Great, uh, Granite Global, Gabriel, Oak, as well as international uh, powerhouse, the Wallenberg family from Sweden. Good technology, didn't have a market here. So struggle, they spent $250 million over the course of six years. And just years. in two sentences, what's the technology? What's the differentiator of the technology? Um, it's just the, it's right now the, probably the best lithium based uh, technology based on NMC and NCA which is a bit a generation ahead of uh, lithium ion phosphate that A123 was successful in deploying here and struggle. So I think it was a blessing in disguise for Boston Power not to get the government grant uh, because otherwise it would be complicated uh, for, for us to participate. What we did, we let the, uh, uh, the investment into the company. It's still Boston-based, Delaware-based company, but we have expand and transform the company to become uh, manufacturing in China, uh, center around the customers in China to respect the market force that Ian talked about. Uh, last week, we completed a factory near Shanghai in Changzhou. Uh, in less than 12 months, manufacturing uh, one uh, potentially up to a gigawatt of capacity this year, starting with 330 gigawatt. How long would it, take it, would it have taken you to do that factory in the US? Um, you tell me. <laughs> And how many, how many cars will be served by that capacity it's, it's, of batteries? It's a lot of investment, but it actually only can uh, serve up to 30,000 cars, which is small. But today, it is the fifth largest fully automated battery plant in the world for dedicated for, for electric vehicles. And just, just, we had this conversation at lunch, but just play this out. What is the, if I'm walking in, to, in Beijing to a showroom to buy something that will have Boston Power's battery in it. What's the proposition for me? What's the economic, what are the economics of that proposition? So we're still experimenting and the market is still very early. But I think the early signals are very uh, encouraging. I was telling our friends, uh, Garcia. Uh, in Hangzhou last month, with our battery, the cars can go 
188 kilometers with one swap of battery instead of 80 to 90 kilometers. Hangzhou, partnering with the state grid, is offering a lease program for the consumers in Hangzhou, 1,000 renminbi per month. Okay, so let me just stop and forgive me, but let me just deconstruct this a second. So state grid, the dominant uh, utility in China, um, probably I think it's fair to say the largest utility in the world. Um, you're talking about swapping. So the, 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 the idea is that, you, that as a consumer, you buy a car with this battery, you swap out the battery, or you lease, you lease the car. car. You, you lease, lease the car, car and swap without it out. any entry costs, 1,000 renminbi, compared to an operating Which is roughly cost, a little less than $200. Right, less than yeah. $200. Comparatively, if you buy a car, a, 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 natural, uh, a gasoline car, your operating cost is about 2,000 RMB. So for $1,000 a month, one day they have 7,000 customers lining up, just like they, we are lining up here to buy the Tesla. One day, 7,000. And what's the trajectory of growth that you're banking on? Um, I think our, our factory, back to Boston Power, our factory will be capacity limited. We'll run our capacity probably by the end of this year. And then you build another one? Hopefully somebody will build it for us. Uh -huh. <laughs> but just to be clear, who, who will, who's the somebody? Uh, the regional government. Regional government. Uh, and so I think that, that that's more scalable than, than us small venture guys. Okay, so I want to get to Ian, but I, but I want to just follow up on two things, because I suspect that this is hanging in the room in an American audience. Two things. One is you said when you started to talk about Boston Power that had Boston Power gotten stimulus money from the federal government, the, the market wouldn't have looked too kindly on your investing in it. Why? Oh, I think that's just a, a stereotype uh, view from my perspective. So I think, you know, I'll, I think, you know, it's still early and it's still a lot of risk, but in five years, 10 years, we'll look back and say, I think the Boston Power model is a good model of tapping mature US technology to solve challenging global problems. So in our case, we just, you know, we let the investment, we still keep the Boston research capability, we're expanding at MIT, and, uh, but the market happened to be uh, in China. And, and, and how, so let's assume that, that your hope is fulfilled and a regional government in yeah. China does in fact build the next factory for Boston Power. How different will that be from what would have happened or would not have happened in the United States? Well, I think if you look at the A123 case, it's a little bit different. Right? That, 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 you know, A123 A take a different trajectory. They had government grants, but they didn't have the market. So A123, another U.S. battery maker, which did receive federal stimulus money and ultimately sold to Wangshang, yeah. a Chinese company, in the last few months. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. All right, excellent. Ian, yeah, I, I want to add to that point is that there is an industry dynamic that's very different in China versus the rest of the world that allows uh, a battery swapping model to be successful. Um, you have large car manufacturers who are fighting against pure EV. They're pushing for uh, hybrid uh, electric vehicles. In China. Everywhere. Uh, and they're fighting against the battery, uh, battery swapping model because no one wants to <laughs> deliver a battery conforming to one standard set by uh, another party. Uh, that hasn't been successful anywhere else, except China looks like there is promise in that area. Just because there's one or two large power guys, large utilities, you got State Grid who owns, I don't know, 70% of market share in China, and they're a large force. If they're behind it, then there's possibilities of making that model successful. And this is very unique in the, in the Chinese uh, market dynamics. So, um, so Ian, you mentioned that you were in LA the other day, and you were in LA to attend a board meeting of a company that you're investing in, which is a battery company. So, right. same broad area. Um, uh, so, just give us quickly the the play here. What it, the, the company is called? Um, the company is called Innovate. Right. Uh, and what is the? So, this is American technology. What's the? What's the U.S. China play here? Right. Um, so, it, it, just very short. Uh, the company uh, create a silicon anode which replaced graphite, and supposedly that would increase energy density for the battery. So the same amount of space, hopefully that would offer uh, thirty percent or more uh, energy to your to your consumer electronic products. And when you make batteries, it's very difficult uh, to not to have anything to do with China because a lot of batteries are built in China. And but the other thing that uh, really got us uh, excited about this company is the fabulous model that they do not manufacture batteries themselves. Like Sonny was talking about, building a battery factory requires a lot of capital. 
And over the years, we have learned in uh, clean tech investment, it's important to uh, seek for capital efficiency because otherwise, you're deploying tremendous capital into a company before seeing any revenues, and the risk could be pretty high. And China has a lot of the battery manufacturers who are competing on same margins. Um, and this allows uh, this company to offer an innovative technology to a Chinese battery manufacturer and says, OK, you can partner with me, and I offer this technology to you. And you could be making more margins and more volume to the customer that you probably didn't have access to. So to be clear, this is an American company which is not incurring the expense of building factories in China. Yeah. It's doing, it's having doing some sort of a JV deal or lic licensing deal with a company in China that has manufacturing capacity and effectively minimizing its risk but grabbing the, 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 the manufacturing the, capability. The manufacturing yes. capability. Exactly. Okay. All right. So forgive me for whipping through a lot of stuff, but we have a little bit of time and I here and I want to make room for your questions. So, so we've talked about a couple of really rosy scenarios. Everything's great with the world and batteries are going to fly off the shelves. <laughs> so um, now, let's, now let's talk about LED lighting. And Ian, you had uh, something of a less than rosy experience with LED lighting. Yeah. Um, tell us about the investment that you guys made. Well, I think it's, um, I mean, LED has been a tremendous uh, growth uh, for, or viewed as a tremendous growth. In fact, I think the market is expanding very quickly. Um, but uh, also very quickly is the overinvestment that happened in China. And this is a typical behavior that happened in solar space before, uh, that when the country is fixated on certain industry, there's a lot of capital flow that will go into uh, the industry. Like Sunny was talking about, local government could help you to build factories, and that happened to LED. Um, and we, uh, there are some successful investments in LED, but there is one particular that, that uh, we invested in, uh, in the chip manufacturing, and great technology. Um, Leading, in fact, in some of the parameters uh, in, in, the, in the UV light and green lights. Uh, however, just because the price of the global LED market has come down so dramatically, it has squeezed a lot of the margin out of that company. It's still uh, going, uh, but not as well as we had originally planned. It's really because of another type of behavior that happens is the heavy investment that could be supplied by the Chinese capital source that would uh, in, uh, create the oversupply. What's the name of the company? Uh, I, I would prefer to keep it uh, <laughs> <laughs> private for now. <laughs> okay, so what are, the, what are the implications of an investment like that going sour? Yeah. Well, you know, we're still trying to do many different things to turn it around, but uh, really is the, uh, this, the multiples that you're projecting will be different. I think the key learning uh, from here is really how do you view uh, a momentum play? In China, and will that momentum happen too fast? This is uh, this has happened. To, uh, we had some experience before in solar. We invested in LDK, uh, which is LDK, a, LDK, a very large solar panel maker in China, which is now which is now which is not not doing well as, as not well doing as well. Was. But we invested in LDK. The company went public in a year, and then we sold our stock in a year before everything happened. And that was a very successful momentum play, and um, it actually made multiple times for the money. But there could be controversial cases in other space when the momentum could happen too fast. Uh, so when people making momentum plays uh, in China, you got to be careful about the time horizon there. Um, but there are many other fundamental um, plays, like because when you have the market there in your favor, that will allow a lot more room for risk. For example, uh, some companies that may not be successful in the West but could be very successful in China. So you win some, you lose some. Right? And you, yeah, you, I mean, I, I think it's, it's fair to see some theses uh, probably is riskier in China. Huh, okay. All right, so uh, Sunny alluded earlier to shale gas. And this is uh, obviously, you know, we talked a bit about this last week, but huge, huge, potentially revolutionary development in the world energy system. So, um, you know, as will surprise none of you, there's massive development of shale gas in the United States, huge excitement, um, predictions of uh, massive uh, resource in China, potentially or, or probably greater than the U.S. resource, questions about how uh, long it will take to develop that resource. So, so we'll talk in a moment about actual investments that you guys have made in shale, but before we do that, I just want each of you to address your general worldview on shale gas in China. Uh, that is, that is w how it might be developed and to what extent people like you can make money in it. We have a different view, so that. Go ahead. <laughs> you have a different view. Excellent. So um, the country is definitely pushing for shale gas, and uh, uh, the reserve is very high, uh, ranking the uh, world top. Um, however, 
my personal view is for shale gas really contribute to the energy mix in any significant way, it will take a long horizon. It won't be within the next decade. However, that's not to say there's not investment opportunities in the area because wells need to be drilled and service need to be provided, equipment will be sold. And so there will be opportunities that we're seriously looking into in the more upper stream um, value chain there. Uh, however, as an energy mix supplier, it will take some time. I think uh, primarily- Just to define terms, upstream is the, uh, the exploration and production as opposed to the selling of the stuff and the-, the, the, the yeah. Exactly, okay. exactly. And, and, and one of the comparison is really on cobalt methane, which we have invested. And um, cobalt methane, I don't know if people are familiar uh, with cobalt methane, which are just basically methane in the coal layer. Um, and a lot of people drill and to get those methane out, so that you know, coal mines won't, won't explode and then you actually can sell the methane as natural gas. And that's been promoted by the Chinese government similar as shale gas a decade or more than a decade ago. And now we're only seeing some of the results starting to come out. And that took a long time. There was a lot of enthusiasm into the space, but it takes a long time to really understand the geology to drill and to create a profit out of it. And before we move over to Sunny on this, just to be clear, the rationale for your sense that it's going to take many, many years to develop this resource to a point where it contributes in a large way to the Chinese energy mix, is that because the geology is tougher in China than in the U.S., or is that because the market is different and therefore it's tougher to eke out the kind of technological developments in China that we've seen develop in the U.S.? Why will it take so long? Because I think in the U.S. there's a sense people just are incredulous that China has this resource and is predicting that it's going to take as long as it's predicting it will take. Yeah, it's a... Uh uh, one fold is really the technology. Uh, the geology is very different. So you got to still develop the drilling methodology for China. Um, and the second is uh, there is a lot of business force in it in terms of who is drilling, what concessions is being sold to home, and who is developing, and who are going to play in the energy mix in, in the country. And, and those business of, forces impede the development of shale gas rather than promote it. It could promote, it could impede, and we're still yet, I mean, we're waiting to see how that pan out. Um, because to give you an example, right now there were four concessions being auctioned in 2011 and 19 concessions being auctioned last year. And there was, um, you can see who. These are concessions to drill for shale gas. To drill for shale gas. <coughs> right. And particularly last year, the 19 concessions, uh, a lot of them are participated by the local state, uh, state owned enterprises or government related enterprises, not having too much experience in power and, and drilling and partnering with third parties to work on those concessions. And one could only imagine how well those will be done. And, and you know, whether that will be a good news for the industry or bad news for the industry, we're still yet to see. But you haven't invested yet. We haven't invested in shell gas, but we're looking at investing in some service providers. Okay, so over to you, Sonny, I think with a different view. Yeah, I, I think uh, I have a simplistic view, so let's <laughs> frame it. Uh, the estimate the sale gas reserve in China is anywhere between uh, 30 to 36 trillion cubic feet, uh, cubic meters. And compare that to the U.S.? It's slightly, you know, about 30, 50 percent more than, than the U.S. But thank God to, you know, thanks George Mitchell for, for doing all the hard work up front and discovering the... George Mitchell, who came up with the technology in the, the United technology States. And, yep. and, and able to make it economical. Um, so from a venture investor, I look at it is there's a hundred trillion renminbi of money to be made, right? right? Eight, eight, Eighteen trillion dollars. So a, a cubic meter of gas sells about three to four renminbi in China, and and thanks to the uh, wise policymakers in China last year, for the first time in history, we allow private money to explore sale gas as contrast to now all natural gas and oil is monopolized by state-owned enterprise. So just stop and just stress that again. That's a fundamental, right. fundamental difference, right? So, so to me, technology is as an enabler. Technology will diffuse. There's money to be made. There's huge demand for natural gas in China. If of the energy mix in, in the U.S., I believe it's 30 to 40 percent of the energy mix is natural gas. In China, it's less than five percent today. Uh, we buy most of the gas from Russia and Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, uh, transported from uh, west west 
China. As, as we discussed last week, about r r nearly 80% of China's electricity mix right. is coal. Yep. So uh, furthermore, I think, uh, I think um, if the US can help China solve the coal problem with natural gas, it will be a tremendous success globally. Uh, 50 gigawatt of uh, power generator added every year the last five years is coal based. So if you transform that from coal to gas, you solve for half the carbon footprint. So, so before we jump to questions from the audience, tick off the actual investments that you're making in shale gas. Uh, we, have been, uh, we have been tracking it very uh, rigorously thanks to our partners, uh, Bando Carano and, and uh, at Oak, at least I learn about the industry and, 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 and learn about the opportunities in, in Houston. You know, the marginal cost of a, a barrel of uh, oil, a liquid from sale formation is about $10. That's how amazing it is. So imagine if you can do that in China. So we have been tracking both the water recycling space, uh, some of the, the drilling technology, hopefully maybe using brine water instead of fresh water to, uh, to, to, uh, to frack. And uh, um, I think the best learning is to partner with the US partners. So let's Small. just take that water bit. So there, one of the concerns about the trajectory for shale gas development in China is that a shortage of water will impede shale gas development yeah. before a shortage of anything else will impede it, right? right? So if your, your play is that if you can use less lower quality water, that becomes less of an yeah, issue. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of myth uh, in this uh, that, that, you know, the other side of the view is that, you know, China's sale is deeper, it's wrong. Uh, we are drilling, you know, uh, 10,000, you know, uh, feet in Texas. Uh, I, I invited uh, Professor Rich Mueller from Berkeley to China last year, uh, last, last week. And he just saw two maps, map of uh, where China's sale is, map of all the uh, underground water, the prime water is, and they overlap exactly identical. So. So you were in Houston uh, looking at a company, so just tell us lastly about the company that you were looking yeah, we'll at in be, Houston. Uh, we're very excited. Uh, we hopefully we can participate and we're making a, a uh, we signed an agreement already last. Last week. And this Thanks. is a company that does what? Um, using seismic data, using new technology to explore Thai oil. In China? In the US and China. In the US and China. OK, excellent. So we have about 15 minutes left, and I hope that you have questions. If you don't have questions, we've absolutely failed up here. So um, raise your hands. And we're going to give preference to students, as we did last week. Please. You look like a student. Hi. Yeah. Um, I guess part of the theme is like myths versus realities. And so you invest a lot in clean energy technologies. So I guess one of the myths that I would have is, and say it's pretty common around here that people are, are weary of partnering with someone from China because IP protection is thought not to be very good. And for a startup, IP is, can be everything. Um, do you have any comment on that? Is that really a myth or is that something that somebody should be worried about when partnering with a Chinese venture. Do you ever hear that question? Yeah. Great. I, I'll tell you what, that's a reality. No more other comment. That's, that's a, a reality. It's a reality. <laughs> it's a reality. Okay, so, no, but seriously then, how do, you, how do you as an investor who's trying to broker deals between, how do you, how do you deal with the reality? You just deal with it. Deal with your lawyers. <laughs> which, which means what? It means investing more. Keeping ahead of the curve. Ah. Just the same as here with all the startups. So you basically deal with a lack of IP protection by having IP that is so much better than everyone else's that they well, can't I mean, grab it. The reality is we don't have a, a regulatory legal regime to protect it, so you deal with it. Ian? Well, <laughs> no, I'm honest. <laughs> uh, I think on that note, um, it's actually more of a reason to partner with the Chinese investor who would invest and then watch the IP protection on your behalf because this investor become your shareholder. And it's all to his or her interest to protect the IP in China, which could be problematic for you, right? And so you, you want somebody who understands the business landscape, who help you to navigate the, the business there. Um, when we invest, we normally look at IP as two to three year horizon to help you uh, to really uh, create a barrier there, but it's not a lifetime protection. So I think for, particularly for innovative companies here, 
they keep coming up with new uh, things, and that would keep getting them the leadership position in, in the Chinese market as well. And on the other note, there are different ways to structure your, your deal with Chinese partners. To give you some example, there are uh, the requirement of local content. For a lot of the industries that work in electric vehicle and uh, you name it in other field, and you could structure a way that your company is viewed as a Chinese company with joint venture with certain type of arrangement without really, um, really teaching all the know-hows to your customers. And you still can enjoy the subsidies offered by the Chinese government. Um, as long as manufacturing is there, uh, as long as they think the product is produced in China. So there are ways to, to work around that fear. I think there's more of a fear than reality. Uh, I, I have a different view from Sonia. I think it's not going to be a lifetime protection for you. Uh, but with certain structuring, with continued development of intellectual property, uh, you get access to a huge market, and that's worthwhile uh, for your business. Next. Other questions? No other questions. No. Please. Okay, so to pursue the IP issue, uh, China has dominant position, as you know, in the world's markets for rare earths. And there's only one mine in the United States that's producing rare earths down in Mountain Pass, California. And the Chinese, at least one Chinese company, tried to purchase the output of that mine. Our government wouldn't let them. So they made a contract with a Canadian company that did have the rights to purchase the output of that mine. And now all the best ore from our American, Californian, Mountain Pass, Fair Earth mine goes directly to China. <laughs> so, that seems to me a very short term for any protection. And anyone who wants to use the rear earths for manufacturing, batteries, electronics, all this kind of stuff, has to move their operation to China, in which case their IP becomes locally accessible to the Chinese investors there. So that seems to be the real model that's going on with China and the rest of the world is capturing IP by capturing a market for an essential material in technology. So I'd like to know what you think about that. And please go the rare earth issue, because the rare earth is how China has the world by the earth straws. Raise your hand if you didn't hear that question. Okay, so the, I guess the 12-word encapsulation of that, thank you for the question, really interesting question, is um, uh, there's a, been a lot of discussion about rare earths, uh, an ingredient in a lot of the technologies we're talking about. So the gentleman was relating the case of uh, an investment by a Chinese investor, uh, who, where, which an investment in the U.S. In a, in a rare earth mine was thwarted. So essentially through a Canadian company, the Chinese investor bought into uh, a U.S. supply of rare earths, and he's raising questions about, uh, about, about the, the, the advisability from a U.S. standpoint of that. Which of you guys wants to jump into that? There was a news last week, I'm not sure it's true for uh, uh, false news, that Japan has discovered a major source of rare earth. I, right, right. So, um, what should I say? Uh, it's it's all competitive forces, right? So I mean I think uh, I think uh, true China has major majority of the uh, heavy element uh, rare earth uh, resources, but we don't have the technology to refine it better. I mean, the, the main, main market of it actually is Japan. A lot of electronics, power electronics, magnetics, uh, uh, now manufactured by, by Japan uh, in companies. And they, are, they have their, they're setting up their own way of you know, hedging the, the risk. But China does control the world price by withdrawing from the market. Um, that's, that's why OPEC controls the oil. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. That's too bad. <laughs> Well, I think exactly that analogy uh, brings home for me is, uh, you know, certain countries have certain advantage in certain materials, and they're trying to protect that material, and that seems to be uh, the play China is going after. Um, but we have invested into companies that use rare earths. We're looking at investing in a company that use rare earths as an important component uh, for their production. They're, they're located in China, 
they build motors, um, hopefully world's most efficient motors, and they're selling to the global market, and their customers are overseas. And they got to be working really hard to secure that rare supply for them. Um, and so it hasn't affected uh, the business much there. And we also see, because of the fear, Japanese uh, companies are developing new technology in other kind of motors so that they can reduce the use of uh, rare earths. Uh, to me, I think it's really the market force that's in play. And that creates different behavior uh, of the participants in the marketplace. So, so uh, other questions? Uh, right there, uh, Kareem. So there, there was a point made about allowing private in new policy. Can you speak up a little bit? There was a point made about um, a new policy that allows private investment in, in shale gas. Uh, can you just please elaborate on that and mention does that mean that you don't have to have a local Chinese partner anymore on those projects? And then uh, part B of the question is, how does a VC differentiate their business in shale gas from the big oil and gas companies? I'll answer the last part of the question. Um, I think it's a, uh, a great uh, error for us. Um, you know, I, I'm not from the oil industry, yet, but I look at simplicity. Uh, until shale gas revolution happened, the entry barrier to the oil industry is $5 billion. Right? That's the cost of building an offshore oil rig. Right? So we, if you want, we can't get into this. Today, you can buy a 1,000 acres in Texas or Balkan for a few million dollars. You drill a well, horizontal uh, fracking for about 6 to 10 million and you discover oil. So that's, that's the phenomenon with technology. The entry barrier for this industry has collapsed from 5 billion to 50 million. And the same in China. Yeah, and I also think there's um, different ways to participate in this, is that you don't need to own the concession. You, you don't need to invest heavily in owning that asset. Um, there are participants who have technologies who can drill, who can service, who build customized equipments, which are tailored to, uh, to capture that market, and that could be very capital efficient. It could be a very uh, good position for venture capitalists to invest. Kareem, you had another question. Was the other question answered? Uh, on the, I just wanted like, further details on the new policy that allows private investments in, in the upstream. So uh, to be precise, it's private Chinese money. <laughs> Uh, but already Shell and many other U.S. companies are already partnering with the Chinese players in developing it through a service agreement. So I, I want to just take uh, sort of moderator prerogative here and ask an inelegant question, which I think has been behind a lot of questions here. And then I, I will do it quickly and go on to your questions. And here's what, you know, this, it was a sort of OPEC analogy that I think is a, is a, is a widely held view or at least a widely held uh, expressed view in the U.S., which yeah. is, this is wonderful. We're having a discussion about Chinese-American capital, uh, the globalization of capital, Chinese uh, uh, investors investing in Silicon Valley companies that aren't finding the investment at home. But at the end of the day, there is this view in the United States that um, it is as problematic for the United States to be beholden to, this is what the way it's often expressed, is beholden to Chinese investors in clean energy as it is for the United States to be, to be beholden to Middle East producers of oil. And I just, I guess, um, I just want you to sort of address that head on. It, first of all, is that, is, that, is that an argument that you find relevant in your world? Apart from the rhetoric, do you have to contend with that in any way that's relevant to your investments? And second of all, do you think it holds water? We, uh, in Chinese, um, we say, um, two grasshoppers um, tied up with one string, and that's, uh, how a lot of Chinese view the China and U.S. relationship, particularly when it comes to energy and environment and a lot of different factors. And I think the fear here, you, you described the U.S. view. There's a lot of Chinese view is saying, oh, our foreign reserve is all in U.S. debt, and we're tied to, to America. Um, the fear is both words, but I think a lot of times, particularly when it comes to uh, a lot of the energy plays that we're investing is, is misguided. Um, and... Um, um, it's actually preventing a lot of the innovations to, to be shared on a global level. And energy problem is a global problem. If those innovations are not shared globally, then first of all, there's a risk of the heavy investment made by the U.S. government is going nowhere. 
And second, because there's not a market in the U.S. Because there's not a market, and you don't find the enough, uh, sufficient capital to develop those technology now, particularly in this climate. And and second, right, they're not being, they're not going into the supply base, uh, the market base, which has the biggest energy problem now. Um, but I, I think a lot of it is misguided. And if you talk to many of the uh, companies in China, they can invest anywhere else, but coming to the U.S. is the most difficult place to invest. Uh, if you talk to the state grid, and the, buying U.S. asset is the most difficult uh, exercise they can go through. For political reasons. For political reasons. But they're, they're doing business elsewhere, everywhere else in the world. Sonny, you want to take a stab at this? I, I, think, uh, I think market opportunities and will transcend a lot of those uh, challenges. I think the opportunity is can you build a new set of global players, whether it's LEDs <coughs> or solar, or sell gas that can displace all the incumbents in the industry. I think there's opportunity to do that. I think um, some will fail miserably, some will succeed. So, you know, hopefully 10 years down the road, you have a new set of players that displace GE Lighting and Osmer and Philips with LED. Similarly, hopefully you can have new set of energy companies that can display the Exxon Mobiles and, and, and VPs and so on. And that's only possible through technology and, and, and market forces. So I, I, I don't see the boundaries. I, I think those are artificial boundaries. You think of the U.S.-China boundaries are artificial boundaries. Okay, we have a couple, room for a couple, time for a couple more questions. Um, please. Um, we talk a lot here about the value of debt and how it's hard for companies once they get beyond D.C. to get enough capital to scale. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the capital markets in China and what you've seen your companies do once they get beyond the DC stage and do they have greater <coughs> access to capital being there? What are the sources? Are they government related or, or private? Did everyone hear that question? The question is people talk about the valley of death in the United States, that is a lack of capital to go from pilot projects to full-scale commercialization. So when, when these guys are funding the deployment of technologies in China, how, do, how is that valley that, that, uh, how's that valley play out in, in, in China and get bridged? Just go past the valley, get to California. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? I, I, great monies will always be uh, where uh, great ideas. So if you have great ideas, I, I think capital will come. You don't see capital as a problem in China? People. People are the problem? I mean, you know, you need great leaders, you need great entrepreneurs, and if you have great ideas, the money will come. Huh. And, um, so we do clean tech only, and um, the, a lot of the mistakes in clean tech was exactly on the point of the lack of disciplines to invest in science projects, in, in our views. There are hundreds of millions put into uh, certain areas, uh, certain companies, without seeing really a revenue uh, generated at the end of the tunnel. And You're talking about the U.S. or China? Uh, U.S. and some, some Chinese companies. And that has been a problem, and what we're trying to see is other ways to invest at the right stage. Um, in fact, from a prototype to production, it's a better stage to invest because there are certain validations in your technology already. And um, you, you have hopefully a clear path of revenue from that investment. And if you can partner with the right customers that you hope, hope could be your part, uh, customers uh, in China or globally, then you have less risk of go to market. And um, I, I think the important part in our thesis is really find the capital efficient model to invest into a clean tech companies. But once you pass the revenue stage, there's tremendous supply of capital uh, in China. Um, I don't know much about the US, but really there's sufficient capital supply to fund the growth. And the capital market um, um, in, in China, uh, before Chinax is being now uh, a shutdown mode, uh, all the clean tech companies going there are being offered with 70 uh, price, price to earning ratios. Now it has come down a little bit to 30, but still a very high uh, PE ratio. A lot of companies are there, uh, raise sufficient capital without the gross uh, angles for them. And they're buying and investing in new companies. We see Steel and Enterprise who are now taking the country's mandate to develop a lot of the clean tech related business. And they're trying to grow their business by investing and buying a certain asset in the space. So once you go past the revenue stage, I think there's tremendous capital. So we're, we're basically at time, but is there, are there one or two people who are dying to ask very short questions? Carlos. So uh, I'm particularly interested to 
hear what challenges you see stand in the way of clean tech companies trying to enter the Chinese market without the aid of a, a Chinese partner or firm because you've been very positive on the whole about the potential for uh, American technology companies in the Chinese market, but there are significant barriers, I feel, culturally, financially, uh, politically. So what are challenges that you see for these companies without the aid of a venture capital firm? Well, I think part of it is really uh, find a local team, which is important, who are familiar with how the business is done there and helping to navigate the landscape and with trusted parties uh, that their interest is aligned with you. Uh, building a local team, localize, that would be the key word. And, and it's actually interesting, a lot of VCs in China would not invest in people who just return to China uh, because it still takes a few couple of years of learning curve to really get to understanding of how business is done there. Uh, you got to drink the baijiu, uh, the, the, the rice liquor. Uh, that's just one example, a lot of the business um, adequate uh, in China. So building a trusted local team or business savvy enough it will be a key thing. Sonny? Well said. Okay, excellent. So look, we're going to cut it off there. Um, thank you guys very much for coming. Uh, before you sneeze, just hold on one second. Thank you to Ian. Thank you to Sonny for traveling a long way. I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot. I actually hope you're leaving here with more questions than you had when you walked in. And if you are, then, then we will have accomplished the goal. Just, just two housekeeping announcements. Keep tweeting if you want to keep tweeting at uh, hashtag Stanford Rising Power. And lastly, this is the second in a five-part series, so please come back. The next, the third part will be next Monday here where we will talk uh, about solar with um, two executives of prominent Chinese-based solar companies. Um, and you can find all about that session and the additional sessions on the Energy Seminar website. Thanks again very much. Thank you guys very much. Yes. Yeah.